straightforward. One of the world's most famous coastlines looks a lot more like an outdoor washing machine. Massive amounts of sea foam spray inundating the shoreline of Cape Town as the COVID cases in South Africa rise sharply. COVID-19 crisis, Florida's record-shattering rise in coronavirus infections, the new cases linked to this 4th of July party in Michigan. Officials plead with younger Americans not to attend these so-called COVID parties. A 30-year-old man in Texas who believed the virus to be a hoax is now dead after reportedly attending one such party. Houston's mayor proposes a two-week shutdown to try to contain the outbreak. Los Angeles School District's plan for in-person classes starting next month and the conditions set by New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo in order for schools to reopen in New York. As the country yearns for leadership, President Trump has a message today. Everyone is lying, criticizing both doctors and the CDC. It comes as ABC News learns from White House sources the president's aides sometimes refer to Dr. Anthony Fauci as Dr. Gloom and Doom. President Trump today insisting he has a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. Meanwhile, Trump's former chief of staff breaks from him, calling the lack of testing and delays, quote, inexcusable. The investigation now underway after a devastating explosion and fire on board a U.S. Navy ship. Dozens of sailors and firefighters now injured. The blasts, extensive damage. After decades of refusing to give up its team name, owners of Washington, D.C.'s NFL team are finally dropping the term deemed a slur by many Native Americans. So why now? Mothers of the movement, seven women whose children's lives ended at the hands of police come together at this pivotal moment. If I can save the life of another mother's child, I'm going to do it every day of the week. The remarkable conversation and how their painfully unique perspectives can help shape the change so many are calling for. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. All right, let's start off with some good news because we all could certainly use it. This weekend, New York City went 24 hours without recording an official COVID death. Now that's the first time that that's happened since March, but an altogether different story on the West Coast. Today in California, the governor declared this virus is not going away anytime soon. And he's now shutting down all indoor dining. Meanwhile, the mayor of Houston is pushing for a two week shutdown. Officials across the country are trying to appeal in particular to young Americans to act responsibly. Several people from this 4th of July party in a Michigan lake have now tested positive. And in Florida, one family is now mourning the loss of a brother and sister in their 20s. Certainly a harsh reminder that this virus kills people of all ages. But we begin tonight with Matt Gutman on the dramatic course reversal in America's most populous state. Tonight, California slamming its reopening into reverse. This virus is not going away anytime soon. As COVID-19 sends a record number of patients into California hospitals, the governor today shutting down all indoor business across the state, restaurants, bars, theaters, and museums. L.A. School District, the second biggest in the country, along with San Diego's schools, announcing they'll only reopen online. The health and safety of all in the school community is not something we can compromise. COVID's conquest unrelenting. Daily death rates now climbing in 23 states, hospitalizations increasing in 31 states. In Florida, a growing emergency where hospitals are running out of space. Our Victor Okendo in Coral Gables. Um, we are actually uh, putting patients now in our surge capacity beds, which means that our ICU area is full. And a desperate call for plasma donations from patients who have already recovered from COVID. Doctors fear that need will only deepen with cases skyrocketing to levels not seen in any other state. 27,000 new cases just over the past two days. The virus has now claimed more than 4,200 lives in Florida, including Michaela Hicks and her brother Byron. Both were in their early 20s. My heart, my heart, he went to cardiac arrest. And 39-year-old Renata McGuire, a mother of six, losing her fight against COVID. And then it was even harder to come back and tell the kids that she didn't make it. Her brother calling her children from the hospital bed before she passed away. 
my main thing was to call the kids and let them tell them how much that they really loved them. You know, so that's the best I could do for her at that time was let her kids tell her how much that they really loved her. Houston Rockets star Russell Westbrook, one of the NBA's biggest stars, testing positive for COVID-19, learning before he traveled to the NBA bubble in Orlando. Instead, he stayed behind in Texas. Westbrook says he was feeling well in quarantine, but he's urging everyone, please take this virus seriously. Be safe, mask up, adding the hashtag. Why not? Over the weekend in Orlando, Disney World starting its phased reopening at Magic Kingdom and Animal Kingdom with temperature checks, face masks, and sanitation stations. Texas's governor, who originally resisted a statewide mask order, now pleading with people to wear them. The only way that we can have people continue to have a job they need to pay their bills is for everybody to adopt this practice of wearing a face mask. Houston's mayor calling for a two-week shutdown where hospitals are stretched thin. Look, the hospitals are really strained and stretched. We really can't accommodate many more patients. Doctors in San Antonio warning about the so-called COVID parties where guests expose themselves knowingly to the virus. One 30-year-old man allegedly infected at a COVID party reportedly telling a nurse before he died he made a mistake thinking the virus was a hoax. He didn't really believe. He thought the disease was a hoax. He thought he was young and he was invincible and wouldn't get affected uh, by the disease. For more now, let's bring in our Matt Gutman. So, Matt, what kind of additional shutdown measures are officials in California now considering? Lindsay, they're looking at a bunch of different statistics. The key ones are hospitalizations, ICUs, death rate, and, of course, the rise in cases. Now, it is not going in the trajectory they like, and that's why they ordered this additional shutdown. Uh, salons, bars, restaurants, gyms, places like that in 29 counties and most of the state, indoor movie theaters, indoor dining uh, are basically off limits. But they still have some wiggle room. They can shut it down even more, something that the governor here calls the dimmer switch and one thing they have not ruled out is going back to a stay-at-home order if it can save thousands of lives they're not there yet but they could be at some point in the future and Matt we're also learning more about how long COVID antibodies may actually last and the news could make things even more difficult as scientists try and find a permanent solution to this crisis Studies in England and some in the U.S. and anecdotal evidence as well shows that the antibodies decrease over time. We knew that, but what they're showing is that they decrease so significantly. And the question is, is there enough of a presence of that protein in the body for the body to be able to mount an immuno response to COVID a second time? Right now, scientists don't really know. Um, they believe that there might be T cells and other cells that might be able to remember the presence of the virus and, and therefore attack it again. But there is no proof right now that if you contract the coronavirus at one point, let's say three, six months ago, that your body will be able to automatically fight it off again at some point in the future, which makes it seem more like the common cold, which we get over and over again, rather than something like the chicken pox that you get once, your body remembers it and can fight it off for the rest of your life. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, thank you so much for your reporting. And now to Washington, where over the weekend, President Trump wore a mask in public for the first time during a weekend visit to Walter Reed Hospital Center. But it comes as the White House has moved to sideline, reading leading coronavirus task force member Dr. Anthony Fauci with the White House circulating a memo that points to what they say are things that he's gotten wrong about the coronavirus. ABC's chief White House correspondent Jonathan Carl reports. After his advisors put out information critical of Dr. Anthony Fauci, President Trump told reporters today he gets along just fine with the government's leading expert on infectious diseases. Well, I have a very good relationship with Dr. Fauci. I've had for a long time, right from the beginning. I find him to be a very nice person. I don't always agree with him. But the president recently made it clear he's not happy with Dr. Fauci's warnings that the pandemic is far from over. I don't think you can say we're doing great. 
I mean, we're just not. And Dr. Fauci's a nice man, but he's made a lot of mistakes. After the president said that, the White House gave reporters a list of quotes from Dr. Fauci from the past several months that the White House said turned out to be wrong. It was an extraordinary move, going negative on one of the president's own advisors as if he were a political opponent. The press secretary denied this was opposition research. There's no opposition research being dumped to reporters. We were asked a very specific question by the Washington Post, and that question was President Trump uh, noted that Dr. Fauci had made some mistakes and we provided a direct answer to what was a direct question. Dr. Fauci says he hasn't briefed the president in more than two months. Multiple White House officials tell ABC News that he has a nickname in the West Wing, Dr. Gloom and Doom. Today in a live stream with the Stanford Medical School, Dr. Fauci ignored it all, focusing on the raging public health crisis. We haven't even begun to see the end of it yet. In another indication, the crisis is far from over. Over the weekend, the president, for the first time in public, went along with CDC guidelines on masks, covering his face during a visit to the Walter Reed Medical Center. And Jonathan Carl joins us now. And John, so the president says that he still has a good relationship with Dr. Fauci. So how is the White House explaining why he hasn't then been briefed in two months by Dr. Fauci, especially at a time of surging cases in, in so many states? Well, the White House hasn't directly answered that question yet, although uh, what they would point out is that he isn't the only expert. Obviously, Dr. Burks is there uh, to, uh, to brief the president as well. And the other factor here is that uh, Dr. Fauci is very much still part of the coronavirus task force and in that role does meet regularly with the vice president. But all of that said, it is quite extraordinary that the government's top expert on infectious diseases is somebody who hasn't literally hasn't uh, seen in person the president in over a month. And we also saw President Trump wearing a mask in public for the first time this weekend at Walter Reed. But his comments certainly fell short of calling on all Americans to wear them regularly. Tell us what was said and why it's so significant. Well, uh, you know, it was significant to see him wear that mask. That was something that uh, many people, including some of his own uh, health experts, had been urging him to do to set an example. Uh, so that was a powerful image. But even as he donned the mask, he said uh, that it's something that in the right circumstances would be appropriate, uh, suggesting that, you know, because he was in a hospital, uh, you'd wear a mask, but perhaps not elsewhere. So it was hardly a ringing endorsement for regularly wearing a mask anywhere in public when you cannot be socially distanced. That is what the, uh, the experts say. That is the CDC guidance. Uh, those were not the words that were uttered by the president. Jonathan Carl reporting in tonight from Washington. Thanks so much, John. And we want to continue the discussion of our country's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're joined now by Congressman Jody Arrington, who represents the 19th district in the Texas handle. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Lindsay. So you heard in Jonathan Carl's report right there, any concern from you about Dr. Fauci being sidelined by the White House as cases surge in, in much of the South, including your state of Texas? In your opinion, is it pertinent for the president to still be briefed by the most senior infectious disease doctor in the country? Yeah, I, I don't think I would necessarily sideline Fauci, but I wouldn't give him the megaphone that he's had. He's a singularly focused government infectious disease doctor that whose whose metric is people don't get sick and don't die. Uh, there are lots of risks that people have to manage every day and, and leaders have to manage the fact that we could have far greater uh, implications, adverse implications for being in a in a shutdown mode and not opening our economy, getting folks back to making a living. Uh, there are individual liberties, there are economic implications and long-term public health. So Fauci's one voice, but we need a whole lot more than just Fauci in terms of people in the president's ear and in and, and, and any uh, ear of leaders that are making these uh, multitude of of uh, decisions. Uh, curious just to get your response on the president basically talking about the CDC and doctors today saying everybody's lying. 
Yeah, I don't look. I, I, again, I think you've got uh, government uh, bureaucracies like the CDC. Uh, they have a role, but I would not uh, give them the pen to write the protocols for every state. I think the president did the right thing by deferring to states and local communities. I think he did the right thing to empower uh, the uh, the uh, free market uh, to innovate, to accelerate develops developments of testing, and and to create more capacity around. PPE. So I, I think they have a role, but I would not make them the centerpiece. Uh, the, the, again, people closest to the problems, closest to their community, and, and those folks that understand the conditions on the ground are the best people to handle this and manage it uh, uh, responsibly, and they're the most responsive to their citizens, and citizens ought to have a say in, in a democracy like ours. Uh, in, in our protocols and decisions made, even in situations like this. So let's go on the ground to the citizens, your state of Texas, uh, seeing cases on the rise. But so far, your district is not a hot spot. Are there lessons that you'd say that you would draw from places with huge spikes? And are you telling your constituents to wear masks and also to social distance? I think the conditions on the ground should dictate uh, how to respond. I think every business, for example, uh, is incentivized to take all the necessary precautions. If there's a, a rash of, of COVID uh, outbreaks at various businesses, uh, th that's going to hurt them uh, uh, long term. So again, everybody, I think, has the right incentives. If government will give them information, empower local leaders to manage, including pr health care providers, they can manage the capacity. There's 2,000 beds in Houston, Texas right now. I know that they're seeing a bit of a spike. But again, I think Houston's capacity is different than Lubbock, Texas and Abilene, Texas, places I represent. Um, I think, again, deferring to the local leaders to make those decisions is and giving them the best information is the best way to handle this so that, again, we manage not only the near-term public health implications, but the long-term economic and public health implications for, uh, for our citizens. So, but just to be clear, are you telling your constituents that they should wear masks? I'm not telling my citizens to wear masks unless masks are are the right thing to do the more the most responsible thing to do again every situation uh, dictates different protocols in some cases social distancing in, in other cases it's mask if it's more densely populated but i don't need to make that decision for them they're plenty smart and responsible if we give them the information and with what's happening on the ground, which is different in different communities, they ought to be able to manage that responsibly. And so far, I think Texas has done that. If you look at Texas, Arizona and Florida and their death rate, it is half the city of, of New York half and they've got seven times the population so i think we can expect you're going to see an uptick in numbers of cases for states that are reopening on the heels of july 4th celebrations all around the country and then if you got a, a you know a situation like houston where the mayor has led tens of thousands of people in in uh, in protests and march in marches uh, i think all of those are contributing factors i expect that it will be managed back down to a more you know reasonable le uh, level. So many of your Republican colleagues, including Texas Governor Abbott, have come around to advocating for Americans to wear masks in public when they can't socially distance. Would you say that the president should be more forceful in supporting that message? I think the president, it really, Lindsay, has taken the right approach and that's saying, hey, states, governors, and local leaders, you are more responsive to your people. You are more sensitive to the conditions on the ground. And we all know that there are some basics in this uh, prevention of the spread, like good hygiene, like social distancing, and in some case, cases, masks. And I, again, I think local leaders, I think citizens in every community, business owners, are all incentivized to do the right thing and the responsible thing, not just for them, but for their entire community. I haven't seen uh, uh, I haven't seen that uh, play out in a way that's that's surprising or unmanageable at this at this point. Congressman, just for academic debate here, I'm just curious. I mean, the CDC has said definitively masks make people safer. Masks help eliminate the spread. Why are some the people, especially in politics, so reluctant to say, hey, guys, let's be safe. Let's wear masks. Well, we, we have had government officials and public health experts 
uh, including the Surgeon General, say one day that masks work and other, st uh, other days that, that masks aren't the best uh, a way to manage it. I'm suggesting that we should let local uh, leaders and our citizens make those decisions unless there is systemic inundation of the health system. I think if the state were completely inundated and overwhelmed, that would be a different scenario. And 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 if your your local community is inundated and overwhelmed, then I think you can ratchet up restrictions and you can engage, uh, um, you know, more definitively with various protocols. But unless and until you have that kind of systemic adverse. Uh, impact. I, I, I think you defer to the to the citizens, and and I think because most folks would say this isn't just about the near term public health impact. There are intermediate and long term economic impacts, and we should always, in the mix of the decisions, consider people's personal liberties. I think you can do all the above and and manage this responsibly at the state and local level, and and I think so far Texas has done a pretty good job of that. Okay, and I want to stay on that economic point that you were just making. You made a comment that businesses should be compensated by the government for shutdown losses. What specific measures do you have in mind? And what's your bigger concern, exploding deficits or state and local governments and businesses going under because of this crisis? Well, I have a tremendous concern about the fact that we have the highest debt load uh, per GDP than we've ever had as a nation. And uh, if we ever have a sovereign debt crisis, we won't be able to uh, to borrow money and print money fast enough to bail out of that crisis. I think we've got to keep our eyes on that and we've got to manage it responsibly. Um, and so, um, you know, in terms of uh, shutting down businesses, not just saying let's wear masks, let's do the various things that I think, again, can be extreme if there's not a systemic uh, problem or they're going to overwhelm and inundate the health system. Uh, but but I do think if you're going to say, hey, these businesses are going to shut down, you that's a taking. You've got to compensate these folks. This is their livelihood. This is, this is how they care for their families. And I, I think that there should be shared risk and responsibility at the local and state level. You cannot have a situation where the federal government's going to come in and bail everyone out. Everybody's got to manage all of these objectives. They all have to manage the risks, and it can't be put on one uh, entity, uh, especially the federal government, which is notorious for spending trillions of dollars and not having much concern about the debt and the now almost $4 trillion in deficit spending in one year. So you've got to have a shared risk and responsibility model if you're going to have people make the right decisions and not create moral hazard where we're bailing people out left and right. That's the wrong approach. Congressman Arrington of West Texas, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. Great to be with you, Lindsay. Thanks. And next to the investigation into that devastating fire this weekend on board a U.S. Navy ship, more than 50 sailors and firefighters injured and some still in the hospital. How could this happen? Martha Raddatz has the latest. One of the main radar and communications towers on the ship now collapsed. The heat so intense, reaching 1,000 degrees, the smoke so dangerous, 400 sailors and firefighters forced to rotate on and off the ship every 15 minutes as they battled a massive blaze. Navy helicopters dropping hundreds of buckets of water on the burning ship and powerful jets of water pumped from boats and from shore. Well, the superstructure damage, which you can see visible, um, there's obviously burn damage all the way through the skin of the ship. Nearly 60 sailors and civilians were injured from smoke inhalation and exhaustion, all now released from the hospital after an explosion in the cargo area of the ship quickly spread. The Bonham Richard was undergoing maintenance when the fire broke out. The Navy is determined to see her get underway again. But the fire is not yet under control, and even if it survives, it will likely be years before the the ship is back in service. And Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, what more can you tell us about why the suppression system on board the ship wasn't working? 
Well, Lindsay, it's because it wasn't operating because it was also getting maintenance. It was the ship, of course, was in the dock because it was undergoing maintenance. So that fire suppression system was turned off. We should add, however, that the Navy does feel confident that they can stop the fire before it spreads to the lower decks where a million gallons of fuel is now being stored. That would be the worst case scenario. Lindsay. All right, Martha Raddatz, thanks so much. And when we come back, the outpouring of grief and the heartbreaking discovery, an update on that search for the missing actress who once starred in the show Glee. Disturbing claims pitting neighbor against neighbor, including dead animals being left to send a message, and it was allegedly all caught on surveillance. And they are one of the most storied franchises in NFL, but for years, some have said that their nickname was a racial slur. And now finally, Washington's team is changing its name. Welcome back. One of the most controversial team names in sports history is being removed. Washington, D.C.'s football team has announced it will drop the term many Native Americans have been saying for years is just racist. After decades of pressure, what finally turned the tide? ABC's Rachel Scott has this story. Tonight, Washington's NFL team buckling under pressure, dropping the Redskins name and logo. Announcing the franchise's new name will inspire our sponsors, fans, and community for the next 100 years. The Navajo Nation still with harsh words for the team that's used the racist slur despite decades-long outrage, saying this change did not come about willingly by the team's owners, but by mounting pressure and advocacy of indigenous peoples. On behalf of the Navajo Nation, we thank and commend all of our indigenous brothers and sisters who dedicated themselves to a just cause and won. We knew it was a long shot, but you know, sometimes you don't fight a fight because you can win. You fight it because it needs to be fought. It's such a good decision for the country, not just for Native peoples, because it closes a painful chapter of denigration and disrespect towards Native Americans. Today, the White House press secretary saying the president believes Native Americans would have been upset at a name change, citing this tweet from last week. He uh, says that he believes that um, the Native American community would be very angry at this, and he does have polling to back him up. But this team's racially insensitive name has long been in dispute. In 2002, the California DMV stopped this man from using the term for his license plate. It means uh, football team. Just that's it. Just a football team like the... Steelers or the uh, Vikings. I don't think the Vikings are mad. <laughs> Owner Dan Snyder once famously said, we'll never change the name, never. You can use caps. You're gonna have some people that feel a certain way, absolutely, we respect those opinions, but I hope they respect our opinion. The turning point came when some of the team's biggest sponsors, FedEx, Nike, and Pepsi, demanded a name change. FedEx threatening to remove its signage from their stadium, a move that could potentially cost Snyder tens of millions of dollars. The economics of it were not going to allow Washington's football team to continue on with that nickname. Just weeks ago, a statue of the franchise's founder, George Preston Marshall, the last NFL owner to integrate, was taken down. Now their trademark name, a thing of the past, too. And Rachel Scott joins us now from outside of FedEx Field. Rachel, any word on what the new team name will be? Lindsay, this has fans on the edge of their seats. No official word yet from the franchise, but that is not stopping people from throwing out some suggestions. So on the list, you got the Washington Red Tails in honor of the Tuskegee Airmen. You got the Washington Red Wolves, the Washington Warriors. Your guess is as good as mine, Lindsay, but a source does tell ESPN that the franchise does plan to keep the colors. Lindsay? Okay, all right, ABC's Rachel Scott in the nation's capital for us. Thanks so much, Rachel.
And joining us now is someone who's been at the front lines of this issue for years, fighting for the removal of native mascots and names among sports teams. Amanda Blackhorse is Danae and a member of the Navajo Nation, and she is also the spokesperson for NoMoreNativeMascots.org. Thanks so much for joining us. After years of protests, letter writing, press releases, lawsuits, and feeling like you weren't making much progress, how does it feel to finally have the team acknowledge that it's time to change the name? Well, I mean, it's definitely um, a great moment in our movement. I mean, Native people have been calling for this moment for decades now. Um, so it feels really great, but I'm also just very cautious about um, what's going to happen next with the team. Cautious, why so? Well, they didn't make it clear in their statement that they will leave Native imagery, any Native themes or any Native names out of the rebrand. They are going to retire the name and logo, but they did not say what they are thinking of moving forward. And given the team's history and their treatment of Native people um, and refusing to listen to us, um, I mean, there is a possibility that they could choose a Native theme. And that's not a win for us. It's, it's, it's a step in the wrong direction. And now for people who are resistant to change and don't understand the need for a name change to begin with, explain why the name is offensive. Well, I mean, just think if you had um, a team with any other race as their mascot and you had an emblem, a stereotypical, stereotypical emblem of them, um, imagine what type of stereotypes that come out of that. Imagine the behavior of fans, um, how they would mock that certain culture or that ethnic group. I mean, it's very problematic because what you have that come out of these games are people wearing red face, people dressing in headdresses, mocking our spirituality, mocking our culture. Um, and it really dehumanizes us as Native people. People don't look at us as humans anymore. They look at us as mascots. Mm. And you're also advocating for other professional team name changes, such as the Chicago Blackhawks, the Atlanta Braves, and Kansas City Chiefs. Are you optimistic that these other organizations will consider similar name changes, or do you fear that there's still a long battle ahead? I mean, it sounds like some of them are already resistant right now. Like the Atlanta team, they mentioned that they're not going to change the name, but they will look into the Tomahawk Chop um, at their games, which they've been looking into for almost a year now. Um, so I don't know what's so hard to understand about how offensive that is. Um, so it sounds like, I mean, the, the Cleveland team did say they were going to re review the name. I'm not sure where they're at with that, um, but we definitely are looking at other teams as well. And I just want to circle back to the Washington team and the R word. Um, it is a racial slur. If you look it up in the dictionary, it says it's offensive um, racial slur. And we've even, in my case, with Black Horse versus Pro Football, um, we litigated and it was determined in litigation that the R word is an offensive term. So that's been solidified. And there's no reason why it should be the name of a, of a football team. And you say the Atlanta Braves have been looking into this for a year to determine just how the Tomahawk Chop is offensive. So we're all ears. Tell us why it's so offensive. Well, the Tomahawk Chop is essentially um, just mocking um, the um, genocide of indigenous people. You know, the motion that people, when people do this, it's, it's, it's violence. It's it, that people are bringing into a game and, and treating it like it's, you know, a fun act and it's a part of the fandom. But for native people, it's a grim reminder of the genocide that our ancestors had to endure. Um, and so when you have a stadium full of people engaging in this sort of thing, it really just makes you feel invisible mm -hmm. as a Native person. And our voices are, are, are just erased. And I imagine a lot of people don't know uh, about the, the harm and, and the, the, the meaning there. What do you say to those who argue that using tribe names like the Blackhawks or the Seminoles isn't meant to marginalize, but rather to honor these tribes? Well, I mean, I think that we've been doing this for a very long time. There's no excuse that people should not know this information by now. 
I mean, you, we're talking about, you know, there's been waves throughout the last few decades of this being in the media of protests that have been happening. Um, so it's been out there. I just think that some people refuse to listen and want to continue to say that they're honoring us, even though we have said time and time again that it is not an honor for us. Um, and that just shows the power of our voice versus the power of their voice. Their voice is more powerful. They have more, they're given more of a voice and more of a platform than actual Native people. And that's the problem with mascots, is that it lowers um, our, st our status in this country. In addition to advocating for the changing of team names, you're also a social worker, and we've all seen the Navajo Nation hit especially hard by the coronavirus. But recovering right now, while many other parts of the country uh, continue to get worse, how are people in your community faring at this moment, and what are some of the unique challenging challenges that they're facing right now? Yes, I mean, it's, it's definitely a very difficult time right now, um, especially, you know, on the reservation, um, and even off as well. Um, I live off the reservation, so, you know, just worrying about my family and what they're going through, um, it's, it's, it's a very, very hard time. And I think it just goes to show the, the systemic racism that we experience as Native people. Why do we live on reservations? Why do we live in conditions where we don't have access to clean uh, running water? Why don't we have access to electricity in some areas? You know, why do you have families, multiple families living in one home? Why is it that we only have one grocery store within a hundred mile radius in some areas? Um, and so that goes to show that the, the systemic racism um, bleeds into um, our economics and our government. And so I think that's a prime example of that. And that's why we are being hit so hard. On, on the reservation. Understood. Amanda Blackhorse, we thank you so much for your time and enlightenment tonight. Thank you for having me. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. Seven mothers with one shared nightmare. Their children were all victims of violence, mostly after interactions with police. Tonight, they come together in one remarkable conversation that you will not want to miss. But up next, we drill down on the career of Dr. Anthony Fauci. How did he become one of this nation's leading infectious disease voices and a man that people on both sides of the aisle say we should trust? But first, our tweet of the day, the president of South Africa paying respects to Zinzi Mandela, the daughter of one of the titans of the 20th century, Nelson Mandela. She passed away this weekend. Welcome back, everyone. With what's beginning to look like a growing rift between President Trump and Dr. Anthony Fauci, we wanted to take a look at why Dr. Fauci is often described as the top infectious disease doctor in the country by the numbers. For 36 years, Dr. Fauci has directed the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease as part of NIH, where he's overseen research on AIDS, malaria, Ebola, SARS, Zika, and other epidemics. His agency has a $5.9 billion budget for 2020. Fauci has advised six presidents 
Republicans, both Republicans and Democrats. He was the principal architect of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, known as PEPFAR, a program that was launched by President Bush that's been credited with saving more than 18 million lives around the world. Fauci has authored, co-authored, or edited more than 1,300 scientific publications. And he's ranked number 41 of the most cited researchers of all time by Google Scholar Citations. 45 universities have given him honorary doctorate degrees, and he graduated first in his class from Cornell Medical School. He's also been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor for his groundbreaking work on HIV AIDS. And still ahead here on Club, new details about the arrest of Jeffrey Epstein's alleged co-conspirator, Ghislaine Maxwell, why the FBI claims that they had to break down her door. The new lawsuit against the Trump administration aimed at reversing that rule, stripping foreign students of visas if their colleges move exclusively to online classes during the pandemic. And that remarkable conversation with seven mothers who all lost their children too soon. Their message for all of us. But first, here are some of the trending stories on abcnews.com. The numbers in the fight against COVID-19 in the United States are growing grimmer by the day. Today, 39 states in Washington, D.C. are seeing increasing cases. Florida announcing 12,600 new cases today, the second highest total behind Sunday's 15,000. Some city leaders in the state now considering shutting down once again. This week is going to be um, the tell-all. As cases rise in California today, Governor Gavin Newsom announcing the closure of all indoor dining and bars statewide. A lot of these activities that were happening inside, uh, like restaurants, moving those activities outside. The White House is now attacking the credibility of Dr. Anthony Fauci, launching efforts to discredit Fauci's prior statements on the coronavirus. President Trump Monday morning retweeting messages critical of Fauci and the White House putting together a document obtained by ABC News that says several White House officials are concerned about the number of times Dr. Fauci has been wrong on things. But the list includes many quotes that are not complete or were from early on in the outbreak when less was known. The notion that there's opposition research and that there's Fauci versus the president couldn't be further from the truth. Dr. Fauci and the president 
we've always had a very good working relationship. This, as the president for months, has repeated falsehoods about the coronavirus. Fauci said last week he had not seen the president in person since June 2nd. Notre Dame has joined MIT and Harvard in a lawsuit against deporting foreign students, calling the ICE proposal that foreign students who have to take classes online have to return to their foreign country inhospitable, even hostile. This sign taped to the door of a Long Island home tells the story of a single mother who says she's the target of ongoing threats and racial harassment. Jennifer says her white neighbors made it clear she was not welcome. Then she started to find dog feces on her property and more recently a dead squirrel. The previous owner said they ran her out of the neighborhood because of the dead squirrel she used to find and she just couldn't take it anymore. Right now we're just trying to give her as much support and love that we can. Jennifer says this photo shows one neighbor with a gun. There is also video of a neighbor spitting on her property. Others in the community have rallied around Jennifer and her daughter. The police are investigating. After a three-month extension, tax day is almost here. The deadline is this Wednesday, July 15th. If you're owed a refund, you'll have to wait. The IRS says they're up against a huge backlog. If you need more time, you can file for an extension, and your new filing date is October 15th. But there are steep penalties if you forget to request an extension before Wednesday. The failure to file penalty is 10 times higher than the failure to pay penalties. The IRS will work with taxpayers who are going through a difficult financial situation, but the message is contact us. Let us know what your story is. Let us know how we can help you. And welcome back. In less than 24 hours, the alleged co-conspirator of Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, is set to have her bail hearing. But tonight we're learning new details of her arrest, how the FBI came in, what she was allegedly doing, as her legal team continues to assert that she is not a flight risk. Our Eva Pilgrim reports tonight from outside the high security detention center where she's being held. When FBI agents arrived at this 156-acre property in New Hampshire to arrest Galen Maxwell, prosecutors say she tried to flee to another room in the house. Agents were ultimately forced to breach the door. Inside the home, agents found a cell phone wrapped in tinfoil on top of a desk, a seemingly misguided effort to evade detection from law enforcement. Prosecutors in a new court filing today asking a federal judge to keep Maxwell, the former girlfriend and alleged co-conspirator of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, behind bars, saying she played an essential role in sexual exploitation of minors. Maxwell is also being sued by three women who allege she and Epstein worked together to abuse them, including Annie Farmer, whose lawsuit alleges she was 16 when she met Epstein and Maxwell through her older sister, Maria. They were master manipulators. I think that it's a particular type of, of sickness that they displayed in um, taking advantage of, you know, the love you have for a sibling. Maxwell's bond hearing is scheduled for tomorrow, and this is still very much an active investigation. Prosecutors say multiple witnesses have come forward since Maxwell's arrest. Maxwell denies all allegations. Lindsay? Thanks, Eva. And they are called the Mothers of the Movement, but that's a title that they would gladly give up if they could just have their children back. Seven black mothers all thrust into the national spotlight in recent years after their children were killed either at the hands of police or in racially charged altercations. These mothers agreed to join our Deborah Roberts in a rare and powerful conversation about their grief and how they're trying to turn it into a call for action. Here's Deborah Roberts with their story. Seven mothers, once strangers, now connected through heart-wrenching pain. We're never going to recover from this. We're never, ever going to recover from this. I have not met a mom yet who's lost a child who has recovered. We never recover from it. We live it every day. Sabrina Fulton still mourning eight years after losing her oldest son, Trayvon Martin. At times it can feel hopeless and you feel helpless because you never know when you're going to be watching a news uh, story in your home, in the safety of your home, and the next day, you're it. You're never going to know the pain that we face because you are not experiencing that particular pain. No one understands what this pain truly entails and all of the dynamics that come with it, unless you have walked in our shoes. 
And every day I pray that those shoes don't have to be put on by another person. So it's heartbreaking. Michelle Kinney's 17-year-old son, Antoine, unarmed, was shot down during a police stop two years ago. None of us asked to be thrust into this role. It has become a job for most of us, and I know for myself. I no longer have a son out there. And I'm still willing to get out there, lead the way, push the movement, and, and, and open up some doors for some other people. Her agony today, no less than that of the moms of Breonna Taylor, killed in a botched police raid in March, or Ahmaud Arbery, gunned down recently while jogging. I share the same pain. The same pain that these ladies have, I have. The sleepless nights. In a rare gathering, these grieving moms sat down with me to discuss their shared heartbreak, thrust upon them after losing beloved children violently, most at the hands of police. You sent a message to um, Tamika, Brianna's mom, on her birthday. Yes, ma'am. What did you say? I just wanted her to know that I knew that that day was going to be very difficult because Ahmad had a birthday on May the 8th. And it was days prior, just days prior of that video being released. And that was one of the most heartbreaking days that I've ever had. It was nice, though, to get the message just to know that, you know, somebody feels the way that I feel. You know, I'm surrounded by all these people, but they don't really understand what I'm going through and how I feel. A lot of people reached out that day, people that you don't even know. Um, I did a report that day. People chanted Brianna's name as they were protesting. But yet you were dealing with this personal loss. What was, what was that day like for you? I didn't want to be up out of bed. I didn't want to deal with people. But the, like you said, it was all these people who I don't even know who came from everywhere to celebrate her life. So I had to get up and I had to talk and I had to be around these people. And and don't, and I'm grateful. I, I really am. But just that day in that moment, I didn't want to be that person. I didn't, you know, she's not here. She wasn't here to enjoy it. Sabrina Fulton, what do you say to someone like Tamika Palmer, who is so newly in this horrible, painful club that you all are a part of. You're going to have to come back from, from your deep depression, your sadness, your disappointment, and just not having your child. And one of the things you have to do is you have to pull from the strength within. Strength each one says they struggle to find. Allison John still can't understand how her 26-year-old Botham was shot dead sitting in his own living room by an off-duty Dallas police officer. She was later convicted. I didn't even want to see other people happy. I didn't want to see people laughing because I lost a son who did not deserve to die in the way that he did. And I believe the protests that we're seeing right now, although there were protests after every single incident, and I'd reached a point where I was asking, when will it ever end? I kept saying it over and over. I thought after both of them, it would have been the end because I kept saying that I did not want to see another family suffer the fate that we did. And I'm so sorry to Tamika Palmer and to Wanda Cooper and to the other mothers who have lost sons following Botham's death. For these moms, witnessing George Floyd's death was yet another devastating blow. More agony, more outrage. You relive it all over again. And, 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 and I can't equate it to anything but PTSD. Being a black mother in America right now is just, it's stressful. As waves of protest wash across the country, Eric Garner's mom, Gwen Carr, says demonstrations must lead to legislation. The mothers on this call and other mothers, we understand it. A lot of people are just following the protocol. They see other people uh, demonstrate and they demonstrate. Some people are just in a home, but we got to be about a movement. After her 12-year-old son, Tamir, was shot dead by police while holding a toy gun, Samaria Rice is channeling her pain into a fight for political change. 
the platform that I have that America has provided for me. And let's talk about that. They provided it for me because they murdered my son. And no parent should be able to endure nothing like that because that's out of the ordinance. But when you do experience something like that, it's like I got to prepare myself for whatever happens next. You know, before I wasn't doing none of that. I was just really just living a normal life. I was just really living, like, just trying to take care of my kids, uh, you know, and, and then this horrible tragedy happened, and now I'm, like, angry. I'm angry being Black living in America. I'm, you know, so I'm new into this position. I didn't, I don't think I ever really understood my position in this fight prior to what happened to my daughter. Um, of course, I always had opinions, and, and I've always was worried about what was happening to my black community, but I didn't know my position in the fight. Another part of it being that I have black daughters. And sometimes I think that we don't think that it can happen to them because so many times they're swept under the rug. People don't hear these stories about these black women, but I'm now learning that I have a higher position in this fight and, and whatever I have to do to remain in it is what I'm going to do because it should never happen to another Black daughter, son, another Black person, period. What I would encourage people to do is take a look at what happened with these tragedies and think to yourself, what if that was my son? What if that was my daughter? Just put your family member, your loved one in their place. And that should open up your heart in order to get involved. And, and when I say get involved, I'm not just talking about uh, social media likes. I'm not just talking about reposting something. I'm, I'm talking about really getting involved. I'm, I'm talking about uh, you can't continue to be silent because it could happen to you at any given time. If you are African-American, I, I shouldn't have to tell you to get involved. You, you should, by the mere fact that you have children, or, or you have compassion for somebody else that has children, it should compel you to get involved. You, you should not turn your face away from what's going on right now. Y your heart should not allow you to do so. As uh, a mother, a mother of a 17-year-old black son and a 21-year-old black daughter, um, I don't think I've ever felt more vulnerable and more um, frightened and more exhausted. And all of you ladies, uh, with your pain and your purpose, give me hope. I personally feel like this. If I can do it and I don't have a son out there, every black person should do it. I stand by the philosophy that I am black and I am proud. And anybody who is black should be out there on the front lines right with us. I'm not, I'm no longer trying to save the life of my son. That is gone. But if I can save the life of another mother's child, I'm going to do it every day of the week. Such compelling conversation. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts and to all of those mothers. You can see their full conversation and read original essays from them at goodmorningamerica.com. And when we come back, celebrating the life of actress Kelly Preston after her private fight against breast cancer.
Welcome back. It was a battle that few knew was even happening. And tonight, the tributes are pouring in for actress Kelly Preston. She passed away after a two-year battle with breast cancer at just 57 years old. Our Kaylee Hartung has more. Tonight, an outpouring of emotion for the death of actress Kelly Preston, losing her private battle with breast cancer at 57 years old. She starred in a number of hits, including Jerry Maguire. What was our deal when we first got together? Brutal truth, remember? I think you added the brutal. Preston was diagnosed two years ago. Her husband of 29 years, John Travolta, writing on Instagram, she fought a courageous fight with the love and support of so many. I will be taking some time to be there for my children who've lost their mother. So forgive me in advance if you don't hear from us for a while. This family has endured tragedy before, losing their 16-year-old son Jet to a seizure in 2009. Tonight, Preston's daughter Ella honoring her on social media. Anyone who is lucky enough to have known you or to have ever been in your presence will agree that you have a glow and a light that never ceases to shine. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Friends and family of actress Naya Rivera, including her Glee castmates Amber Riley and Heather Morris, seen here holding hands earlier this morning before authorities revealed the tragic news that her body had been recovered days after she disappeared at a lake in Southern California. Rivera was reported missing last Wednesday after she went out swimming with her four-year-old son and did not return. Officials say she was able to get her son back on the boat, but unable to save herself. Rivera was just 33 years old. Years old. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.